Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a joy to continue to lead you in the Word of God as uh, this is my second to last Sunday and the reality is hitting me, as no doubt it is hitting you, of, of the Lord uh, bringing to conclusion, and I'm going to say a particular beautiful chapter, a chapter that has, ex has gone on for 12 years, almost, almost to the day, and how God continues to bless this congregation and I continue to reiterate to you, my brother, my sister in Christ, that if you have any doubt about the future of this congregation, just look back at the past 12 years and how we have gone through all sorts of things, extreme, extremely high mountaintop joys and lows that we were, weren't even sure where we were going to worship the next Sunday. And God has provided beyond our greatest expectations. And in this season, God will I can say this without a shadow of a doubt. God will provide. So will you trust him is the question. A man came to Jesus and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In the gospel reading for today. And it is about trust and our desire to want to manipulate God and specifically his law. And so we'll address this beautiful parable that Jesus, Jesus brings to us, uh, the parable um, of the Good Samaritan. And as always, I always like to take it a little bit and turn it an angle and perhaps cause you to contemplate about the depth and the beauty of God's <laughs> Word for you. You'll find plenty of announcements in the bulletin. Please pay note to those. Uh, this is an exciting time, especially with... Um, our, our youth are getting pre prepared to leave on a, on a trip out to, out to Pennsylvania, and we, we pray for God's blessing upon that. Um, we have um, a celebration next Sunday. Um, we have an opportunity to invite people to come and worship uh, at, this, at the fair. God just continues to bring stuff to us, and we have much work to do as the harvest is rich and the workers, the laborers are few. Um, you'll also view, view the schedule of the week here, um, and it's, again, in our typical fashion, laden with many things. In our prayer concerns today, we're going to continue to lift Carrie and Linda and Jamie in our prayers as they struggle with cancer. We're going to lift Barb uh, Buker, um, with Things have moved rather well, thank God, um, but she continues to need or require our prayers. Uh, visited Sharon Root in an enriched and care center. She's recuperating with her knee surgery. And um, it was just really touching with uh, providing a prayer shawl. That's part of our ministry here is prayer shawl. And she just um, bursted with thankful tears. And so that's just a continuation of our ministry. And we'll, we'll lift Nolan Sutherland, uh, grandson of Gretchen and Jim Sutherland in our prayers. And I would also ask you as we pray um, for my family, on my mother's side of the house, uh, the Triblehorn family, as um, we're dealing with death and dying, uh, the, the next layer, the next generation, and my eldest uncle, the, the would-be patriarch of the family, had a heart attack last yesterday and died, and now is in the glory of the Lord. So um, we'll, we'll include the Triblehorn family in, in our prayers as well. Are there any other announcements that I need to have besides Karen coming up? Come on up. I'll invite Karen to have a few more words with you. Good morning. I'm uh, just trying to allay any confusion that we have about our meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. I really appreciate everybody that has considered and given their prayers for our congregation and how we're going to uh, call our next pastor. And we've had many sign up 
to show their want of serving our church in a call committee. Everybody that is on that is signed up has been asked to come tonight at six o'clock. Everybody that is on those lists will be able to sit with our full council and tell about themselves, introduce your strengths, your experience, and what you foresee in a call for a new pastor. That's what's happening tonight. There will be no decisions made tonight. It's kind of a very informal, let's say, interview process so that we can determine the council on Tuesday night, or at least start considering, who will be appointed as our seven member call committee. So if you have signed up, please know that we're expecting to see you tonight, six o'clock, with a three to five minute presentation about yourself. Hope that clarifies everything for everybody and we'll see you tonight. Thank you, Karen, for adding clarity to this. Well, here in this service, it's a custom of this order of service to bid each other the peace of the Lord as we proceed. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Thank you. And would you stand and share that peace with one another? I invite you to stay standing as you're able and we'll uh, open then our worship. Come now is the time to worship. It's on printed in your bulletin.
We invoke the name of the true God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Indeed, our Lord and Savior invites us to come, come before him, to lay down our trophies, to lay down our sins at his feet and to take up his yoke, for it is easy. He writes through his evangelists that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, it is God who is faithful and just and has promised to forgive us of all our sins. So let us take a moment of silent confession and then we will join our voices together and sing the confession song. The song is in the inside cover of the green hymnal.
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. You are set free. Turn to your bulletin, and there in the bottom third is our prayer of the day. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Richly inspire us, O Lord, to consider and accomplish what you see is good. For we know that we cannot live without you, but that with you we shall prevail. And so we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. Let us hear from God, reading God's word today is Jim Satterley. The first lesson today is talking about uh, caring for our neighbors. The word of the Lord was given to Moses concerning the ways in which Israel was instructed to care for those among them who were poor or in need. Leave some of the harvest in the field. Do not gather the fallen grapes in the vineyard. Do not take what is not yours or lie to another person. Pay your workers immediately. Love your neighbor as yourself. The first lesson is from Leviticus 18, 1 to 5, and 19, 9 to 18. It can be found on page 100 in your pew Bible. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall do my ordinances and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinances by doing which a man shall live. I am the Lord. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field to its very border. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you fall on the grapes, uh, the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go up and down as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand forth against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason with your neighbor, lest you bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbors as yourself. 
I am the Lord. Here ends the first lesson. The psalm can be found on page 233 in the front of your green hymn book. I shall read the uh, odd verses, odd-numbered verses, and if the congregation would follow with the even. Again, that's page 233 in the front of the green hymn book. Psalm 41. Happy are they who consider the poor and the needy. The Lord will deliver them in time of trouble. The Lord preserves them and keeps them alive so that they may be happy in the land. He does not hand them over to the will of their enemies. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed and ministers to them in their illness. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies are saying wicked things about me. When will he die? and his name perish. Even if they come to see him, they speak him to words. Their heart flakes all the rumors. They go outside and spread them. All my enemies whisper together about me and devise evil against me. A deadly thing, they say, has fastened on him. He has taken to his bed and will never get up again. Even my best friend, whom I trusted, who broke bread with me, has lifted up his heel and turned against me. But you, Lord, be merciful to me, and raise me up, and I shall repay them. By this I know you are pleased with me, that my enemy does not triumph over me. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from age to age. Amen. Amen. The second lesson encourages us to walk in the ways of the Lord. The Apostle Paul thanked God for the saints in Colossae. He urged the people to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit for the gospel. He told them that they were qualified to do God's will and proclaimed them the good news of redemption and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The second lesson is from Colossians 1, 1 to 14. This can be found on page 902 in your pew Bible. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid out for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and growing so among yourselves from the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth, as you learned it from Ephrus, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here ends the second lesson. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 25th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered right. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer desired to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Children, would you join me up front here for a message? Good morning, come on up. Good to see you guys. How are you? Good? Well, what I read to you from the pulpit there is, um, is a story from Jesus that we call parables. Parables are important stories and sometimes they really caused people to scratch their head and go, I have no idea what that means. And then sometimes Jesus tells parables that really just kind of get you. It goes right to where you're supposed to go. And so this man wanted to put Jesus to the test, and I'm going to say more about that in there. But um, he wasn't really interested in getting an answer. He just kind of wanted to make sure that Jesus was like the real deal, or maybe he was trying to embarrass Jesus. We don't know, other than put to the test. But Jesus tells him this parable that we know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as I read to you, this guy uh, is on a, on a trip, and he gets beaten up. You know, back in the day, and it can still be today, it's, the, the road can be a scary place in that you can go someplace where you, maybe, maybe this isn't a good place to be, and people will rob you and hurt you, and, and this is exactly what happened to this man. And two people come by that you would expect because of what they believe they would be the first to assist. A man who is a priest think pastor and another was a levite which is uh they are they were very very godly people but it was one who was a samaritan that actually came to aid now a samaritan is think about i don't know think about the the meanest worst person in, in that you've ever thought of or whatever um somebody maybe that it would be really really hard to like this is the one that comes to help you and that's Really, the story here is the one who helps us is Jesus. Jesus is despised. He's nailed on a cross. He, he's, he's despised by his people. And he's the one that provides the perfect care. And because he does this, then what do you think we ought to do? Show mercy to all people, even if we don't like them, even if they're mean to us, My friends, as you grow up in the faith, it's going to be increasingly tough. I wish I could say it's going to be just a beautiful walk with Jesus and everybody's going to love you for loving Jesus. It's not going to be that way. It's going to be hard to be a Christian. But we're called by Jesus 
to love all people anyway. And if nothing else, pray for them. Father, forgive them, just as Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is what it is, and this is what Jesus has shown us to do. So let us pray. Father, we give you thanks that through your Son, you have shown us an example how we ought to live. And Lord, we fail. We fail miserably at this. And so we come before you at the cross, and we give you thanks that you have shown us that your Jesus, our Lord, covers all our sins and even uses us in our own brokenness to be his feet and his hands. We thank you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, would you help hand out? Thank you, sir. Will you help out hand out the candy? Yeah? It's kind of heavy. There's a lot in there. All right. Did you get a candy? Okay. Get a bulletin. You're going to find in our bulletin our next song, Ancient Words.
what's new to us. What a wonderful hymn before the message. Thank you. Thank you. To God be the glory. No doubt we all have a very favorite, favorite parable of Jesus, our Lord. And um, often, um, sometimes it kind of throws us because we've been engaged in this parable perhaps all our life and we've come to rest in a particular message or a particular thought and then when we have a chance to tease apart these words we realize that the traditions in which we have rested upon might be a little bit skewed they're not wrong but they're a little bit skewed uh, the classic is the, the probably our most favorite parable is the parable of the prodigal son we read ourselves into that and it's but it's not about you. It's about the father who runs and restores his prodigal. And likewise with this beautiful parable, this heart-touching parable that we love so much, that this parable that Jesus brings to us in an interesting encounter with a man who was maybe not necessarily ready for such a parable. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers, dear sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. This parable that Jesus brought to the lawyer and to us is better known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. It is known, I'm sure, by heart that perhaps, if nothing else, that at least shows up on the regular readings at church. You've probably been taught this parable in Sunday school or, or maybe, maybe a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. This parable is easy for us to retell. And, and granted, we, we might not exactly get the order right of who passed by the, the poor beaten man we might even leave out the reason why Jesus told the parable in the beginning. But we all can talk about that good Samaritan who stopped, who went out of his way to help a stranger. I've heard this parable used to rip apart a devout, pious Christian life because notice it was the Levite that walked on the other side. I've listened to this parable used to justify not to gather to worship in a formal sense, as we need to get busy, get out there, do the work. I've heard this parable used to diminish the necessity of the office of word and sacrament, which we would know as the vocation as pastor. Notice the priest went on the other side. But is that the message of this parable? I'm told that every world religion has a similar story. Does that make Jesus just another teacher of virtue? Can we go to Muhammad of Islam and Buddha of the Far East and get the same message? Is Jesus just a, just a teacher, a wise and gentle but young teacher in the Jewish tradition? Is that all he is? What makes this parable Christian? Or better said, what makes this parable Christ-centered? About this time in the, in the Gospel of Luke, we're, we're on the tail end of the 10th chapter, Jesus has, has, is now on a mission. He's on a mission to go to Jerusalem. Luke records he has set his face to Jerusalem. Along the way, a lawyer asked Jesus this question, what must he do to inherit eternal life? If you really tease that apart, it's, it's, it's kind of a senseless question, really. Think about this. Would you go to Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon and a bazillionaire? Would you go to him and say, what must I do to get in your inheritance? Maybe in your fantasy, but I doubt you would do that. No rational person would ask such a silly question. The bottom line is, one does not do anything to be in an inheritance. Inheritance is determined by the giver, not the one who would be the receiver. 
So already this is an interesting event. Jesus answers the question with a question, actually two questions. In the law, he says, what, what has been written? How do you read it? And the second question may be read as, how do you understand it? Or, or maybe, how do you interpret the law to others? And the lawyer saw this as a slow pitch over the plate. And he did what any good Jew ought to do. He recites the Shema, which was a little bit was alluded to in that, in that uh, Levitican reading. Love your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. This is an important prayer in Judaism to this day. It is to be recited in the morning and in the evening. But the lawyer also answered, which is interesting, because Jesus is recorded as saying the very same thing in Mark, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then said to the lawyer, you're right. Now do it, and you will live. Now, now it turns into an interesting angle here. And I'll say that the lawyer now found, found himself in a bit of a pinch. Luke records that he now asks this question to justify himself. And he says, and you know these words, who is my neighbor? Remember, Luke records this that the sole reason that the lawyer came to Jesus, in fact, I think it says he stood up, so they must have been, he must have been with Jesus as the teaching was going on, and then he stood up, and I, I got a question. But that question wasn't to find an, an honest answer. That question wasn't about how to give glory to God better in his life. This question had a, had a mission. It was to test Jesus. Jesus' answer turned the whole affair back onto the lawyer. What the law demands would be more than this lawyer could deliver, if any of us could deliver. The lawyer must have recognized this really quick, as usually the one who is in law has a very sharp mind and can act quickly on their feet. That now he realized that he had to cut this law down quickly. It's one thing to love your God with all your being. It is enough to love your neighbor. But it has to have limits, doesn't it? And there's the root of the second question, who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus breaks out into this wonderful, beloved parable. And if this parable was just about morality, well, that's fine then Jesus would be just like all the other figures in the other false religions. It is less about one who has been beaten, robbed, and left for dead than it must be about me and how I must be a good shepherd or a Samaritan. Out of the kindness of my heart, out of the kindness of who I am, I stop and I take care of those who are less fortunate than me. And as I've walked with you, we're really good at this. We're really good at this because no matter what happens, I have seen you, I have seen others who profess to be Christians that in the kindness of their hearts, when tragedy strikes out of nowhere or even as it grows to be more of a burden on people, I've seen the hot dishes come. I know the stories of working on the neighbor's car who has no money to fix that car. And most of us are pretty good at offering some help to our neighbor. And if I would com compliment you on that, you would go, oh, shucks, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We know that. You were raised to do the right thing. In this parable, Jesus means what he says. We do need to be good Samaritans. We do need to take care of our neighbors. We need to show mercy to our neighbors. However, his concluding exhortation, go and do likewise, reminds us of how far, how far we are from loving sacrificially or selflessly others as we follow Jesus Christ. 
And while we help as needed, it's often if it works out for us. We often assist out of the abundance of our time or our money. We offer assistance as long as it doesn't call a deep, cutting sacrifice. If it's totally out of our way, if it requires you to cut into your savings, Lord, have mercy. And what if you don't like that person? Or what if that person has been unlikable to you? This parable has another angle that is less obvious, and we need to remember it. Remember whom Jesus is addressing first in this parable. Who is he addressing? This is a devout man of faith. When you're a lawyer in the Jewish world, you were a lawyer on the word of God. This young man knew God's law inside and out. He was a devout Jew, and no doubt very proud of his bloodline and the traditions. He was proud, probably too proud, that a Samaritan would ever touch him, much less minister to him. In this time, a Jew would travel a Jew would travel from, let's say, going from either Jerusalem to Galilee or Galilee to Jerusalem. You, you, there was a route that you would go that you would have to go one way of, across the Jordan and then eventually go another way because you had to go around Samaria because a good Jew would not walk through the dirty land and the, and the tainted land of Samaria, let alone be near Samaritans. Therefore, the parable forces the listener, first this lawyer and to us, who among you would permit a Samaritan, a lesser person, serve you? And this takes a greater depth to it when we understand the victim here. The victim is laying half dead in a ditch. He's given this passive role. There's no narrative in this parable of the victim. Therefore, to be served by the Samaritan is the inability to resist. And how many times have you been offered some assistance? No, 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 it's okay. Oh, oh, I got it, I got it. it. It's like it's in us by default. I want to help you. No, 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 I got it. I don't want to be a bother. This half-dead man had no choice in receiving mercy. The despised half-breed Samaritan had become the instrument of God, an instrument of grace. It's easy to read ourselves into the script as being the Samaritan, but we are the ones that need help. Oh, I can aid and assist all day long, but to recognize that I have a need That's a blow to my pride. To admit that I have fallen and I cannot get up is humiliating. And I will do everything to avoid such a situation. I don't think I'm alone. Notice that that man who was robbed is stripped of his clothing. And I would... I I think it's faithful to read into this that he was beaten beyond recognition. For anyone who has gone through the tragedy of physical or emotional or spiritual or financial distress, there's a battle for dignity. And often in this battle, they, they don't even recognize themselves. I can be a good Samaritan Oh, Lord, send me to be a good Samaritan, but I bid you, Lord, keep me out of the ditch. I don't want to be the one whose wounds are to be dressed. 
What makes this parable of the Good Samaritan distinctly Christian is that this parable is about Jesus as the Good Samaritan in his incarnated life. It is Jesus like the Samaritan who goes to Jerusalem. It is Jesus like the Samaritan who is despised by all and would prefer that he would die. It was he like the Samaritan who God-fearing people despised. He stood to pick up the one left for dead, put it on his own beast, and said to the innkeeper, whatever it costs to restore the beaten and bruised, I will pay. What this parable teaches us is that grace truly comes to those who cannot resist it, who have no other option than to accept it. To enter this parable is to get into the ditch, is to be so low that grace is the only option. The point may be as simple as this. Only the one who needs grace receives grace. Or said in another way, God's mercy comes only to those who have no right to expect it. This parable requires us. This parable requires us not to identify ourselves with the Samaritan, but to identify ourselves, ourselves with the beaten man and to realize that we cannot save ourselves. We can offer not even assistance. And you need to tell yourself, I am one breath from death, and I cannot do this life on my own. Oh, there are some people that fool themselves and think they are. It's God just like a child who's starting to walk. It's the, like a loving father who's right there, right behind this child, and she thinks she's got the world made because she's made 10 steps, but he's right there to catch her. That is what our father's like to those who want to rebel against him. It requires our souls to submit. I need you, Jesus. I need you to come to my rescue. And there is no one to turn to. There is no one coming to save me but you. There is no one else, Jesus. Not even myself. And as the psalmist says, I am yours. Save me. My brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow travelers, the good news is Christ Jesus is present. The good news is that Jesus is the Samaritan of Samaritans when it comes to the goodness of providing all that we need to restore us to life eternal. And how must I inherit eternal life? How must you inherit eternal life? Here is the good news. That through the waters of holy baptism, you are an inheritor of the kingdom. And don't let anybody tell you differently, not even your own conscience. That Jesus has washed away all your sins, and with his atoning death and Calvary's cross, you already have the kingdom. It is yours. And yet we're required to walk on these trails in this life to be good Samaritans to those because our wounds have been dressed. We have been made whole. And he has laid down his life, the greatest cost of all, so that we could be whole. We are the recipients of the work of the good Samaritan. And so... Yes, let's live lives that are worthy to be called a Christian. Let's live in forgiveness and forgiving others. Let's live in the shadow of the cross. Let us live as princes and princesses of the kingdom. Perhaps this is best captured in the first letter of John, not his gospel, but his first letter. It's in the third chapter. We know love by this, 
that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in us who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Ancient words that bring us comfort, to bring us instruction, and to bring us the promise as inheritors of the kingdom of God. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds now in Christ Jesus, amen. My friends, would you stand with me and confess your holy faith? We're going to use the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 85 in your green hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll receive our offering, and while we do, we'll sing the doxology that's found in the bottom portion of page 2. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, our possessions, all signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. With each petition, I will end with, Lord, in your mercy, I ask that you would respond with me, hear our prayer. Almighty God, by the power of your Spirit, grant us knowledge of your will, a right understanding of your word, and wisdom in following Christ Jesus, so that we may at all times and in places have eyes to see our neighbors and courage to serve them in your name. Lead us, O Lord, in all truth, as these days draw near, with an end of one ministry and for a beginning of another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Life-giving God, you made the sun, the moon, the stars. You give light and warmth to all creatures. Help us to be good neighbors to those who live in places of extreme heat that need to find relief or cool refreshment. We pray particularly for those of your children who are most vulnerable, the elderly, the sick, and the young, and young children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, be present through the labors of relief workers and peacekeepers. Protect and care for those who live in places where war or violence is a daily reality. 
help community and national leaders to strive for your justice and your peace in all places. We pray for our cities. We pray for Ukraine and Russia, that peace, your peace would reign. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, grant comfort and consolation to those who live with uncertainty and anxiety. Be the healing balm of reconciliation for those suffering broken relationships and the strength of those who are ill or suffering in any way. And we pray especially for Carrie, for Linda, for Jamie, for Barb, for Sharon, for Nolan, and for the Triblehorn family, and for those whom we name in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these and more, Lord, we lift to you, and we commend all whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're going to need your green hymnal for our final song for today, the battle hymn of the Republic, of the Republic number 332.
it's really cool. Go in peace and serve the Lord. We will. Thanks be to God.